and a warm welcome to yet another biography event. My name is Kai Bird, and I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, uh, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center here in, at the City University of New York, and founded by Shelby White, who is with us tonight, and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. I want to thank Shelby for her steadfast support to the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will be on Monday, February 27th, when Peter Beinhart will be interviewing Melvin Leffler about his new book, Confronting Saddam Hussein. That event will take place in the skylight room upstairs on the ninth floor and will also be on Zoom, as is this meeting. Please mark your calendars and register for this and all our other events at the, on the Leon Levy website. Uh, but tonight I am delighted to be here this evening to interview John Jack Farrell about his magisterial one-volume biography, Ted Kennedy, A Life. John Farrell is the author of Richard Nixon, The Life, which won the Penn American Award for Best Biography and the New York Historical Society Book Prize for the Best Volume of American History in 2017. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His new book, Ted Kennedy, A Life, made the list of finalists for the National Book Award, and more recently, it is a finalist for the Plutarch Award, a prize given out by BIO, the Biographers International Organization, which we partner with. In 2001, he published Tip O'Neill and the Democratic Century, which won the Hardman Prize for the best book on Congress. And his book, Clarence Darrow, Attorney for the Damned, won the Los Angeles Times Book Award for the best biography of 2012. Please look for all these books online at bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. So Jack and I will be in conversation for about 40 minutes, and then we'll take questions from both you and our virtual audience. Um, if you're in the virtual audience, please click on the question box at the bottom of your screens to type in your questions. And our deputy director, Thad Zelkowski, will be monitoring the chat box, the question box, and he will try to get, as many, get to as many questions as he can. At the end of the evening, uh, Jack will be signing books in the hallway outside. And again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our events. So on that note, let's talk about Ted Kennedy. Okay. So Jack, I want to begin by talking a little bit about the art and craft of biography as it applies to this particular project. I gather you spent six years on this book? From the idea to publication, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but one of your hesitations you write in the acknowledgments is that uh, before you sort of decided to do it was that you realized there are 40,000 books on <laughs> the Kennedy clan and JFK and RFK and, and, uh, and Ted. Um, so what made you decide in the end that you could tackle this project? Um, well, it was an editor's idea. Um, two of my uh, books came not from here, but from an editor who said, you know, I think time has passed enough. By the time you publish, it'll be 10 years since, um, since his death. And that's usually when the first, it's like a hurdle. It's when the first um, uh, archives are open, the first few biographies are, are, are printed, and there may be something new to say. Now, I knew Senator Kennedy. I had covered him at a time of crisis for the Boston Globe. And I knew him to be, uh, it, I knew it to be a sad story. And I, my biggest hesitancy was, did I want to write that sad story about this tragic, tormented, flawed person? And I, even when it's an editor's idea, they want you to come back with a uh, proposal. And I went out and did six or seven months of research, convinced myself it was a good idea, um, but failed to convince the editor, and he <laughs> changed his mind. So, uh, oh, I hadn't realized that. 
So uh, I switched publishing. After six months of work. Yeah, I, I switched publishing houses. I went to, uh, to, went to, to Penguin, now fully fired up. This is just what I needed, actually, to get my uh, juices flowing. Um, and uh, launched into the project, um, did a cross-country tour of all the uh, of all of his Senate colleagues, uh, Alan Simpson in Wyoming, Robert Dole in Kansas, Orrin Hatch in Utah, Birch Bay in Indiana, and looked through their archives so that I, um, uh, while I was waiting for the John F. Kennedy Library to process Ted Kennedy's Senate papers. And as, I w as we were talking about right before we went on, we, the Kennedy Library got up in, to 1966 and the first few files on Vietnam and son of a gun, this little pesky bug arrives on America's shore and uh, the JFK library closes for two and a half, three years. National Archives closes, everybody closes. And so what wasn't online um, uh, or available through Zoom as nobody wanted to sit across the table and talk to anybody in those days either, um, was all of a sudden removed from me and that had both a um, but, effect on the book so and the also pandemic on the, yeah. was an obstacle, but even before the pandemic, my understanding, uh, I'm, I was startled to realize that, you know, congressional papers, Senate papers, are, have different rules. They're, they're often more closed than presidential papers. Can you explain that? Uh, it's like uh, speeding in uh, the Washington, D.C. Congress owns the property, Congress makes the rules, and they're very protective of themselves so that um, uh, there, there's a rule that says that if you're a, a committee or the Senate itself as a body, a committee as a whole, um, those files will go to the National Archives and they're open in 20, 35 years. But the individual senator gets to decide what is uh, personal and political and keep those. And generally the senators are very elastic about what they consider personal and political, um, and there are huge gaps in the record at the National Archives. Um, and in, and in, for example, when I wrote the book on Tip O'Neill, his family went out and arranged to get some donors. They processed the papers, and they were open at Boston College within five years after Tip's death. Ted, in order to encourage other people to donate their papers to the John F. Kennedy Library, donated his papers to the John F. Kennedy Library, where even if you are a master senator of 40 years, you are not as important as an assistant secretary of commerce from the New Frontier in the Kennedy administration. <laughs> right. And so they have one person assigned to process Ted oh, Kennedy's dear. paper. So um, uh, there will be one heck of a definitive biography of Ted Kennedy in about 20 or 30 years. But <laughs> so they're, they're still not, pro those papers are still not fully processed. No. It, it, it's, it's, glacial is a compliment. I mean, it's. Uh... So I understand there's also a problem with Robert Kennedy's papers, the brother. Yep. Uh, uh, his papers are like completely closed, uh, well, not deeded. And... Yeah, it's, it, the, the biographers have managed to get from the family certain, co section, certain collections. And again, the Robert Kennedy papers of Attorney General in the John Kennedy administration have been those processed are, and, yes, and are those, are, um, those are presidential records. In yeah, fact. Yeah. yeah. So um, henceforth, my joke about Assistant Secretary of Commerce, <laughs> even right. if you're the brother, <laughs> because you're the Attorney General, you get you get um, you get a little bit of uh, get, you get cut some slack. Um, but no, it's a uh, um, it's frustration for the Kennedy Robert Kennedy family, and uh, it's a frustration for the Ted Kennedy family, and. Um, We'll just have to see how it, I mean, the, the segments of his diary that I was able to find in the archives are very tantalizing. They really are, um, they're not, you know, oh my God, a girl died in my automobile 20 years ago today and I'm still plagued with guilt every day. They are more of, you know, I left President Nixon at the White House and on the way back I thought, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, if I, or I interviewed John Rogers, uh, uh, John Roberts, um, uh, who was going to, who's up for being appointed to the Supreme Court. This is how our conversation went. I tried to reach him by talking about Ireland, by talking about our Catholic faith. Roberts re rebuffed me, and um, we had a confrontation over just what was the story of America. Is it a, a continuum towards more liberal, uh, uh, liberal and personal uh, liberty and personal freedom, 
or is it something that, and this is Ted Kennedy speaking, or is it something that you want to take us backwards on? Um, very interesting. Now, these are diaries? Or? These are diary excerpts that um, are scattered here and there throughout the papers, mainly in the speechwriter's files, because when a big speech was coming up, he would let them have his diary oh. entries to, as his thoughts so on which to base. So it's sort of a back door to the... Yeah, and they were supposed to give them back, and they were supposed to be sent to, to Boston in, in several cases, interesting cases they were not, including Vietnam. So I understand that there are also oral histories that you had access to, but a lot of those were redacted. The, um, the, the biggest, again, when I go back to when somebody asks you to write a book, the first thing you look at is you know, what's out there that's new. And the University of Virginia had done his oral history program, and there were 230, 250 oral histories that, of childhood friends, Harvard classmates, people from both John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy's years, and then a ton of the Kennedy staffers, of which there are many, many, many. Um, so that was my, I knew that I had something new that I could write with because at that time nobody had used them yet. So but yes, but, but yes, to answer your question, I, I, I think the big obstacle in the, this is me sp speculating, but I think the big obstacle in the um, oral histories is that Joan Kennedy is still alive. Ah. And I think that the, that re redactions are there maybe to, that there may be something in there that says not until 10 years or 15 or 50 years after um, ev you know, everybody right. dies do we allow the Privacy, to embarrassing yeah, issues, yeah. 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 Um, she was, as you know, um, plagued by alcoholism throughout their marriage. And um, so th th there's no doubt embarrassing stuff in what people said about her. Right. So uh, let's talk about some of the things you were able to discover, um, such as the unpublished diaries of Arthur Schlesinger and his account of Chappaquiddick taken from his conversations with Ted. Yeah. That, that <coughs> like fabulous material. There are about 10,000 entries in Arthur Schlesinger's diary. And of course, he was a, a confidant of Adlai Stevenson. He was the house historian and advisor to President John Kennedy. He was a bosom friend to Robert Kennedy. And he was very close friends with uh, Jean Kennedy Smith, who was um, Ted Kennedy's um, sister, and her husband, Steve Smith, who was sort of the political and business brains in the Kennedy empire after senior Joseph Kennedy passed away. So he was very well situated, and as a professional historian, um, I believed he was eminently trustworthy. And when his journal w was published, when his diary was published, and I think it's called Journals, um, and it's a wonderful book, um, don't get me wrong, the, the, his sons put together 500 entries from those 10,000 um, into a magnificent book. But there was redaction and there was uh, stuff that was left out, and Ted Kennedy was still alive. And so the accounts of what Arthur Schlesinger heard when he went to the Kennedy compound in Hyannisport the week after Chappaquiddick, um, segments of it were included in that book, but not everything. And, and part of what was not included was something that everyone had suspected of Senator Kennedy, of Ted Kennedy, which is that he had panicked and in the initial rush had tried to uh, cover up the crime, tried to place the blame on someone else. Um, it's always been the speculation, never the proof, and now we have it for the first time in, in Arthur Schlesinger's diary coming out of Ted Kennedy's mouth. Him telling Gene, telling Steve Smith, um, that um, uh, the, the first thing that came to my mind was, I, you know, I, I can't let down the family, I can't let down the memory of Jack and Bob, I can't let down my dad. Um, and, and family was both a blessing and uh, a curse for, for, for Ted Kennedy. Um, and so he reacted quite foolishly. He, he, he fled the island, went down to his hotel lobby, fully dressed at two in the morning, and asked the um, clerk very um, ostentatiously, what time is it? <clears throat> so that the clerk would be able to later to say, well, he was here and, and dry at, at, you know, at, at, at 2 right, a.m. Right. Um, and, uh, and I was only talked into going to the police when it became clear that um, the car and her body had been discovered and there was nothing left to do but do that. So given this really dramatic evidence that you unearthed from the unpublished Schlesinger diary, uh, 
Uh, I was astonished to read in one, you know, that one reviewer in particular accused you of giving Ted a pass on Chappaquiddick. Uh, but my reading of your account is that it's very tough. It's very, you know, you, you can't come away from reading that chapter without <coughs> realizing that Ted yeah. was guilty of... The, the, Ted, the, the Kennedy family does not share that person's opinion. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, was not invited to present at the Edward Kennedy Institute in, in Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, it's been sort of a... Uh, um, well, this uh, is a family that has a well, long history of being that's very that's protective you know, you know, of right. that, and, Camelot, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so no surprise that, that now I'm on the, um, uh, another name is added to the list. Yeah. <laughs> Well, anyway, it's, uh, I think your account is pretty damning. And uh, you, know, you write at one point, a finding of negligence, a crucial ingredient to a manslaughter case, had been made. And you know, this, the, the real scandal in the end was somehow that the judge in the case, Judge Boyle's report, which laid all, all many of these facts, just was not released in a timely matter. So do you think that the manslaughter charges should have been filed in retrospect? If, or, or was it just a tragic accident and... and well, it, it all depends on whether or not you believe his story, which he said he had had two drinks that night. To his sister Jean, he said he had three drinks um, and a couple of beers earlier in the afternoon, which a couple of beers if you ask any defense attorney, a couple of beers generally means that you're staggering. Um, <coughs> and and uh, when you go into court for a DUI and you say I had a couple of beers, it means I had a lot to drink. Um, so I believe that he was um, definitely, um, I'm not sure legally under the influence, but definitely in the impact of, the, of uh, alcohol. Uh, Mary Jo Kopechny was very close to the legal definition of inebriated that night, so there was a lot of drinking going on um, at the party, and that would have been enough for a manslaughter prosecution. Um, the judge said that just by going as fast he was going, which was only maybe 30 miles an hour down, down that road, that was careless and that was worth a manslaughter. But I, I can't believe that, I also believe the prosecutors should not bring cases if they don't believe that they can win, <clears throat> just to make a point. And I don't see how a prosecutor could have uh, won that case, especially with a Massachusetts jury. I mean, Ted Kennedy was elected six more times to office. All the little Irish ladies in, in Boston and Swampscott all just, um, there's a picture in my book of uh, Ted running for re-election in the fall of 1970, and he's campaigning in Lawrence, and there's a picture of six or seven nuns holding a banner that says, God bless our Ted. So, I mean, <laughs> The, the Kennedys in Massachusetts at this time, after the two assassinations, um, were just, it was, and, and that was part of the reason that, that, that the prosecution, the initial prosecution was um, mishandled, was that, every, that all these local officials were just, they were part of that awe, and they were dumbfounded about what to do, and they said, well, we'll treat him like any 25-year-old kid who comes to Martha's Vineyard and, and has a car accident in which somebody dies, and that means you plead guilty to 90 days suspended, um, which is what he did. He pled guilty to a crime of leaving the scene. Um, and then we'll just, you know, leave it like that. And then the press piled on and they overreacted in the other direction. And you had a series of extrajudicial probes that no, none of us would have ever faced. An inquest, uh, an exhumation of, uh, a hearing on the exhumation of, of uh, Mary Jo Kopechny's uh, body, um, and uh, another grand jury investigation. Right. So he was dragged over the, the coals, but in the end, there was just so little evidence. The only, in fact, the only evidence that he was there that night came out of his own mouth. There was no, nobody saw them. The car was discovered 10 hours later. So if he had declined to cooperate and stonewalled all from the start, you know, they, they, he might have gotten away with it. But um, there, there was just, I don't think they ever would have got a, a manslaughter no, conviction. Well, it's a pivotal story in the in the whole saga, and you know, of course, it it killed his presidential ambitions for at least a time, and in some ways forever. So, um, 
who, who ended up giving you the most valuable interviews? I, I see you did a lot with Robert Schramm, Thomas Rollins, uh, Victoria Kennedy, the second wife. Yeah, I think that uh, I had one long interview with Patrick Kennedy, uh -huh. and I, that was without doubt the most valuable, um, <clears throat> in which he confirms a lot about what he had written in his own memoir mm. about his dad um, and his dad's uh, torments through life. Um, and, uh, but close next to that was the time I spent with uh, Vicki Kennedy, Ambassador Kennedy now, to the, uh, to, uh, the United States Ambassador to, to Austria, um, who was in, in, invaluable in like saying, no, you got that wrong. Ted always told me that, you know, blah, 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 blah. She came into his life for like the last 15 years. Um, so it, she wasn't there right. for all of the great so she could be a happened. little more objective. She could be objective, that. and she really got, you know, she would, she saw, they were deeply in love. She deeply loves him, and she said, from the first time I sat down with her, she said, he was always lonely, and that's not what oh, you think about wow. when you think about yeah. Ted Kennedy. And Patrick, in the first time I talked to him, said, my dad always struggled with the idea that he was the family, he was the fuck up in the family, and that's the way he saw himself. Well, that brings me to the childhood, to jump back. <laughs> but it's, your portrait of his childhood is just really moving. He was lonely as a child. And I'm, I was struck by this quote on Mother's Day in 1973. Ted wrote his mother, Rose, quote, I'm sending you these flowers to you, even though you sent me to boarding school when I was seven. <laughs> He was, he was still remembering what a terrible well, I mean, experience that must I go, have been. I go back and forth on Rose because she did have nine children and she <laughs> was Irish Catholic and could not say no to her husband. And, um, and her way of, of dealing with this was to use the money to build a structure, um, the, fam the uh, governesses and, and nurses and to get away on her own, whether in religious retreats or to see the world or um, to go to Paris and go uh, shopping. And um, all uh, three, at least three, four, four of the uh, uh, surviving children, including JFK, all at one time or another said, you know, our mother didn't love us. And uh, the most uh, fascinating incident to me along those lines is that uh, we're talking about Camelot, and the word Camelot came from a, an interview with a week after the John F. Kennedy was assassinated when Jacqueline Kennedy invited the great writer Theodore White um, to interview her. And she said, oh, you know, Jack liked to listen to the score from the Broadway musical Camelot before he went to bed at night. Um, and that's where Camelot came from. But in that same interview, and you talk about things that are closed for, for 50 years, uh, in that same interview, Jackie leans across the table and says to, she says, you know, in that breathy voice of hers, Mr. White, she never loved him. His mother never loved him. She went around talking about how that um, she was the wife of the English ambassador, uh, the, uh, of the ambassador to England, the US ambassador to England. She went about talking about her father was the mayor of Boston, but, and then she went back to it again. She never loved him. Jack never felt that his mother loved him. And that, is you know if you once you're sort of attuned to that you look for it elsewhere um, and you find it time and time again in little incidents right uh, yeah. uh, like that she was very cold there's a uh, there's an incident from her diary there's a, a, in the book in which she this is her diary this is not her writing a public relations release this is her diary she's writing to herself um, uh, our children are perfect and they should be. They come from perfect parents of high class, great intellect, um, financial resources. They have been trained in the best of schools. Um, and this is her, her self-congratulatory note to herself in the most intimate pages of her diary. So she was, a, um, the expectations on all these kids was, were high. Now, they were also one of the richest families in America. They, had their teeth straightened by the finest orthodontist. They yeah, when, had when Ted speedboats. turned 21, he was given a million, a million dollar dollars. trust fund. Yeah, a million dollar trust fund. Yeah. So he became insecure, but 
very privileged. Yeah. So it's, it's, and, 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 and in that, in that sort of insecurity that you talk about, I think is the key to, the, to why we, we are um, drawn to them to the extent that we are politically, in that there was also a streak in that family. It sounds almost corny and out of date these days, but of Irish-American grievance, Irish-American um, uh, uh, feeling for the underdog. And it came from their grandfathers who, and their great-grandfathers who came over from, from Ireland and met the wall of uh, uh, obstacle of the, uh, of the Boston Brahmins, the Protestant Anglo-Saxon um, folks. And, and it wasn't like New York. In New York you had Puerto Ricans, you had Jews, you had Irish, you had Italians, you had Germans, you had Chinese, you had um, uh, uh, the uh, blacks. In, in Boston, it was for so many years, it was just this massive breeding clan of Irish Catholics coming over and this small nugget of, of Protestants trying to hold on to the power and, uh, and, and treating them, like they said, like maggots, like, you know, uh, like rats, uh, you know, have got to stop them. And so even in this amazingly wealthy family, you have down to the generation of John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Ted Kennedy, this feeling for the underdog. And as uh, one of the guys who, who wrote for um, all of them, who worked for all of them told me, he, and he said, you ask about a good interview. This guy told me this line and I was like, ah, oh, I know where this is going. Um, this is going right into the book. Um, he said, they were well-fed underdogs with pretty good bite. And, <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, and that's, that's the Kennedy brothers, and that's why there's Kennedy liberalism, and that's why they, they, they did have that little drive that made them something more than just playboys. So let's talk a little bit about the, the Senate career. Um, after Chappaquiddick, he eventually you know, works very hard to become a good senator, and he is personable, and he's a glad-hander, and, and he likes people, right? And, and so he's good at in this small elite club called yep. the U.S. Senate. And he's the youngest of nine. And so he gets there in 1962, he's just 30, he's just cleared the constitutional barrier, and yep. he's really good at walking around with these southern chairmen who are older than him and acting like a dutiful younger brother. And it wins him a lot of, of good grace. There's, a, he'd, he'd been, um, there's no reason why he shouldn't have had that Senate seat, except that Joseph Kennedy, his father, said, this is our Senate seat, we bought it, and we're going to keep it. You know, we're not going to give it away now that Jack got elected president. Um, there's a, but there's a great story. He, he was a tough race, and he went into uh, a debate against Edward McCormick, who was the Attorney General of Massachusetts and the nephew of the Speaker of the House. And they had a, a, a very bitter debate in which McCormick um, pointed across the stage at Ted Kennedy said, if your name was Edward, Edward Moore, uh, there's no way you'd be running for this office. It's a, your, your candidacy is a joke. You've never worked a day in your life. And everybody went, <gasps> debate's over, McCormick won. <laughs> um, the next morning, Ted Kennedy is out campaigning and he's shaking hands at the factory or a, a bakery and uh, one of the next guy who's there says, hey Kennedy, I understand you never worked a day in your life. And Teddy's like, ah, here it comes. And the guy says, <laughs> Let me tell you, you haven't missed a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the anecdotal story that summed up the reaction of, of Irish Massachusetts. People didn't care. They huh? didn't care. They didn't care. Yeah. Wow. So talk about his ability to work with people like Bob Dole yeah. or Orrin Hatch. Or, and, and what did he accomplish in working across the aisle, yeah. which is something that we don't see often these days. Well, I, I think part of the reason is that the, the geography of the country, political geography of the country was very different. You had liberal Republicans, you had conservative Republicans, you had liberal Democrats, and you had conservative Democrats, you had racist Democrats, and you had racist Southern Republicans. So you had four, almost like four, four parties instead of just two. They're much more, the parties are much more homogenized now. Um, but in, in those days, it was not it was the lesson that he learned early on that the only way great things get done in the United States is through a bipartisan action. And he, he saw that by Robert Kennedy going to the House Judiciary Committee with the Civil Rights Bill and working with the Republican minority leaders on the, on, in the House to pass that um, in the House. He saw that with LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson working with the Republican leader of the Senate, Everett Dirksen, 
to pass that Civil Rights Act. He saw it, um, yeah, at one point he saw it uh, 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 in his seatmate, uh, Ed Brooke, the first uh, black Republican, I believe, since, since Reconstruction. Um, and uh, he saw it as time went on, he proved it over and over again. He, he, is, he, had, he had a great staff, he had a lot of money, so he could supplement his staff. With time he had seniority, and so he had lots of staff that would go out there and they would, they would hear stuff, and they would come back to him and they would say, you know, um, Dan Quayle, this new young senator in Indiana, uh, has national ambitions, but he's never gonna be there if he's just the conservative young senator from Indiana. So let's, you know, we have a job training bill that we really want to move in the committee and it would really help if we had an up-and-coming Republican sponsor to, and so approaches would be made and Dan Quayle would be brought in and all of a sudden you would have the Kennedy Quayle bill on re reforming America's job um, training system because somebody knew what Dan Quayle wanted and needed which was to be um, to have a piece of legislation that showed he was something more than a, than a lightweight. So was this good, just good staff work, or was it Kennedy's it, it was personality? Both. It was both. He had, um, he, had, he had a great way of using staff, which was to let him roam, and then come back to me, and then I'll go to the Senate floor, and I'll start talking to people and see if it's possible. Um, and then, once it was possible, then his staff would meet with other people's staff who were great staffers. But um, let me give you an idea. Of, of how successful he was. He worked with Richard Nixon on uh, national health care and the war on cancer. Um, he worked with Gerald Ford on uh, airline uh, deregulation and the refugee crisis that happened after the Vietnam War. He worked with Ronald Reagan on arms control and um, on uh, the battle against AIDS and on a, believe it or not, Ronald Reagan, Ted Kennedy, a 25-year extension of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, on that one as well, he worked with uh, Robert Dole. He worked with um, uh, Dole's seatmate, Nancy Kassebaum, on the Kassebaum-Kennedy health care bill. He worked on the American for Disabilities Act and landmark AIDS legislation with Orrin Hatch of, of Utah. I mean, you cannot name a conservative Republican leader in his lifetime that he did not come together with uh, George, George W. Bush, um, No Child Left Behind, and the fact that we have um, Medicare drug prescription now was a, was a Ted Kennedy, George W. Bush initiative. And one of the byproducts of that, Kai, was that when um, uh, Barack Obama decided to go for national health insurance um, in 2008, that big, major, costly piece of the pie had already passed Congress and had already been paid for. It made the job that much easier. So um, I, I don't know. It's, the intriguing thing is that if he had lived, now, he hated the Gingrich era. I, I always point the finger at Gingrich as the one who brought the, the nastiness into Congress. He hated the Gingrich era. It spilled from the House over to the Senate. Um, and I'm, I'm not so sure that he wouldn't have just wrapped it up and gone back and gone sailing after one more term instead of trying to bang his head against um, uh, uh, the Republican reaction um, to, the Obama, to Obama's uh, election. But... You know, I, I can't see him leaving office before Obama did, and so quite possibly he might have still been there, um, you know, trying to find ways with the Trump-era Republicans. Right. So he, he's famously known best for his work on health care, attempts to get universal health care passed. And, um, of course, this didn't really happen until Obama in 2009, after, after his uh, 2000. Is it 2009 or 2010? Um, uh, that was actually passed and signed? Yeah. Let's see, he's like 2008, uh, 2010. And Kennedy himself dies in 2009. Yeah. yeah. So he never actually saw it. Yeah, he's like Moses on the yeah, banks of the River right, Jordan. Exactly. So this brings me to uh, his, his problems with my subject, Jimmy Carter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, they. Uh, You know, they had a, a tragic relationship. They, there was just bad chemistry from the very beginning when they first met in 1974. But Carter had campaigned on, in 76 on the part of the campaign was based on his endorsement of national health insurance. Um, and then he becomes president and he backs off on it and they have this enormous fight 
And I, I think you and I disagree a little bit about the, <laughs> the, the, the nature of the fight and the, the, what happened, but the, go the, ahead. And the potential of what might have happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, biographers tend to, we, no matter how hard we, we try, we, we fall into the, <laughs> well, you tell the your to, to our guys' camp. <laughs> um, uh, I believe that Jimmy Carter was the kind of president who wanted the messy stuff taken care of. And so he was not, never going to go for a big, major, um, health care initiative um, that we would call national health insurance like Medicare or, or Medicaid. Um, I also think that as his, his, his um, presidency went on, that was, those were really tough economic times, if, if you all remember them. Gas lines, double-digit inflation, what they called the, the misery index, and you know it was not the right time, even though the Democrats had a very strong hold on Congress, to be pushing a new entitlement that was going to add billions to the uh, to the federal budget, but Carter was also a very um, I'm trying to find uh, a nicer word than mean. Um, he was also a <laughs> he, very he could be mean. Could be mean. He was a very <laughs> stern and steely pol political mind as well. And in his diary, when his negotiations with Ted Kennedy fall apart, he writes, "I'm really glad that these negotiations fell apart because." Uh, will be able to pose in the campaign as the responsible ones, whereas if I had to run with this around my neck, I would, I, it would be very difficult um, to run. Now, you're going to come back and you're going to say, however. Um, <laughs> however. Uh, however. Uh, in the end, um, in 1979, as the presidential can campaign enveloped them both, um, Carter came through with something very much like the Affordable Care Act and had a little bit of support in, in Congress for it, and Ted Kennedy, who was about to, who was running against him, just was not announced at the at that moment, um, uh, refused to hold hearings in his his committee. And Carter, to this day, says we could have had the Affordable Care Act in 1979, but Ted Kennedy walked away from it because those personal wounds they last. You know, they're supposed to be politicians. They're supposed to be government officials who don't let the politics and the personal mix but I've never found that to be true, and, and certainly not with Jimmy Carter and Ted Kennedy. Yeah. So Ted Kennedy was very good at working with some people who uh, were political adversaries, mm -hmm. like Orrin Hatch or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. But he, Jimmy Carter and he, tragically, because I think this had an enormous impact on our political... Yeah, oh, definitely. Together they brought us the Reagan era. They and, brought yeah. us Reagan yeah. together because they couldn't agree on a compromise bill and they disliked each other yeah. and they it was just oil and water different cultures different I, culture culture was important i mean massachusetts because t uh, carter had the same problem with my uh, my other buddy uh tip o'neill um so uh, there was uh, you know georgia and massachusetts were were different um carter was also a very prim man and um never uh, appreciated ted kennedy's racy lifestyle um, <laughs> to oh, say the, the least. The, the, uh, <laughs> parenthetically, uh, there was one day when uh, 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 Mick Jagger came to Washington and the Rolling Stones and uh, did a hell of a performance and the staff came back and told Kennedy about it and they said, well, you know, Jagger wants something done in the Senate about um, starvation um, in Northern Africa and so Ted, ah, bring him in, bring him in. So he'd heard about this amazing concert um, uh, Mick Jagger comes in and says, hey, Senator, you know, and, uh, and Ted goes, well, Mick, I understand that you gave quite an enthusiastic performance for somebody, you know, in his, at that time, in, in, in your late 50s or early, early 60s, whatever it was. Um, what's your secret? And he said, well, Senator, I, uh, uh, I have a lot of sex and I drink Gatorade. <laughs> Ted Kennedy said, Gatorade, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but... You could never imagine that conversation happening with Jimmy Carter and Mick Jagger. So that was an example of the difference in, between the two of them. Yeah. No, Jimmy Carter banned uh, liquor in the White House. That's right. He would serve uh, wine and beer. That's right. Um, and, it so, and he didn't like the and Tip O'Neill hated the breakfast too because yeah, there was no bacon. Right. No <laughs> he bacon. Would, he would like <laughs> he would pick things up. Off, he would say, "Ah, uh, uh, what is this? I'm not going to eat this. This is a grit." <laughs> <laughs> It was just oil and water, um, and uh, uh, one of the sad things is that you see, in retrospect, I interviewed Carter's aides for my Tip O'Neill book while they were still alive, 
and, and they regret it. And uh, in retrospect, Jimmy Carter could have given Ted Kennedy you know, a national health care bill in the summer of 79 and perhaps taken away the rationale for a Kennedy candidacy. Sure. Yeah. That's what Mondale was telling, Vice President Walter Mondale was telling Carter to do. Um, but, you know, Carter was just, you know, stubborn in that well, way. Well, one, one argument I heard was that Mondale was saying, give Ted Kennedy what he wants, support it, he doesn't have the votes in the Senate anyway, so it'll go down to defeat, and then you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he won't have an issue to run against you. Yeah. But Carter was stubborn, yeah. and he saw Kennedy as a threat, and uh, someone who was privileged and an aristocrat and born to run, uh, and assumed that he was uh, born to be in the White House, yeah. and he just, it rubbed him the wrong way, and he assumed that yeah. Kennedy was doing this, causing him problems because he wanted national health care yeah. to ru as a, to run as on an issue, yeah. uh, on a national I agree. basis. I agree. Yeah, and I think also that it also, you know, the strategist like Hamilton Jordan um, had identified Ted Kennedy as the obstacle way back in '73 before right. Carter ran, and so once you've identified this person as the obstacle that you need to get past to get to the White House then that person becomes, then, then the political becomes personal whether you try it or not, wh whether you want it to or not. Right. And I think that's what happened. So Jimmy decided that he was instead going to whip his ass. Yep. <laughs> he boasted and, about this. And did. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> yep. He did. He was, uh, people forget that Carter was, you know, politically ruthless yep. in many ways. And then we get to the 1980 convention and Kennedy stays in the race until the very last, even though he doesn't have the delegate count. Two blocks from here. Uh, yeah, right. Madison Square Garden. Yeah. And then I want to ask you about the, the famous meeting on the, in, in the convention where uh, the question was, were they going to shake hands? Did they shake hands? Did they give the victory? Uh, shaking of hands, and was Ted tipsy or not? Um, so it's, a, uh, it's an interesting story, and I think all those things are, are true. Um, but part of it is the Carter's campaign's own fault. Um, they, Carter's aides and Kennedy's aides were like scorpions in bottles that week and tore into each other. And when finally Ted Kennedy was defeated, um, they said, okay, the Kennedy people said, okay, finally we lost, what do you want us to do? And the Carter people said, well, we don't want him in the hall when uh, the president gives his acceptance speech because the cameras are gonna be on him the whole time instead of on the president, so don't want him in the hall. They said, okay, um, why don't we put him, no, no, we don't want him like, you know, um, anywhere where his movement is gonna cause a stir, so what we want you to do is, you know, I guess it was the Waldorf, have him watch it at the Waldorf, and then after Jimmy gives his speech and is waving and the balloons are coming down, then bring him on over. And uh, the balloons it's didn't mistake. come down, which was an omen. The, <laughs> balloons, the balloons got stuck. But uh, Ted Kennedy got stuck in Manhattan traffic, making that four or five block drive, um, in part because some people say that Ed Koch, who was the mayor of New York City, told the New York City cops to hold him up because he didn't much <laughs> like Ted Kennedy either. Um, so Ted arrives late. He had been at a party, um, had been drinking. He had gone over with one of his friends what he was supposed to do, shake his hand, and then raise the hand in the fighter's classic um, clenched fists. He goes over and he shakes Carter's hand, and there's no hands raised. And so he walks over and he's waving to the crowd, and, and Carter comes over to him and they shake hands again. They shake hands five times on the stage that night, and as Ted Kennedy later said, there's no reason why he couldn't have raised his own hand, and mine would have gone up with it, but Ted Kennedy did not have the generosity of spirit to, to do this um, because of the politics becoming personal over the course of the um, campaign. And uh, um, it, it was, what was interesting is that it didn't happen immediately. Maybe one or two of the commentators on television that night said, well, that's funny, there's no, you know, where is that? But then. Mary McGrory of the Washington Post wrote a column the next day, or maybe it was the, she was still at the Star, and she said, you know, this was a big snub. Teddy didn't, you know, do this. Um, and over the years, it became hardened in Jimmy Carter's mind that Ted Kennedy had showed up drunk, 
and had not only failed to do the arms lifting, but had failed to shake his hand. And, as, uh, you know, and only five or six years ago, he was asked about it again, and he said, uh, yeah, Kennedy was drunk and he refused to shake my hand. And it was, it's on the videotape, Mr. President, that's five times <laughs> he right. shook your hand, but um, that's the way that the human memory, <laughs> human memory takes over, yeah, yeah. So um, let's see, a final question. Um, Ted's bluntness about calling Bush's march to war a phony war in, in 2003, uh, that, was, that was pretty tough. And his decision to endorse Obama over Clinton, that was also a, a pretty tough political decision to make. So talk about his political courage late in his life. Um, the Obama one, is the, I, I think, is, is, uh, is quite interesting because uh, Bill, uh, Clinton had done an awful lot for the Kennedy family. He had appointed Gene Smith uh, as the ambassador to Ireland. Um, he had uh, um, sent the U.S. Navy on full um, battle status to go try to find John F. Kennedy Jr.'s plane. Um, he had worked with Ted Kennedy on, on health care. He and Hillary had worked with Ted on on healthcare, and so now Hillary was running against Barack Obama, and Hillary was the champion of healthcare in that campaign. Um, and Barack Obama had no plan; he barely knew anything about it because it had not been part of his interest in the in the Senate. But uh, the next generation of Kennedys, Caroline Kennedy, uh, and some of her cousins came to him, and they were very enthusiastic about Obama. And and Teddy said, you know, to himself, you know, the Clintons have had their chance. Uh, I'm not entirely thrilled with the way that they handled. Healthcare, so uh, um, maybe I should listen to my cousins, that, uh, to my nieces and nephews, and entertain this notion. And he solicited from Obama a promise that uh, Obama would push national health care um, if elected. And then Ted went out and he started campaigning, and he was struck by um, uh, brain cancer. And um, his staff and the Republican s uh, staff of the Labor Committee. Uh, continued to work on the bill, continued to put it together so that when Obama takes office um, in 2009, the bill is there and it's ready to go. You know, it's called the Affordable Care Act, and he's got Harry Reid in the, in the Senate and God, Nancy Pelosi, what a tiger, in the House. And Nancy Pelosi in particular was not going to let that bill fail, even if it cost her control of the House of Representatives, which it did. Um, and they <coughs> fought and, and, and got it passed. And... Uh, Ted's role in that was that while he was recuperating, he was constantly, savvy politician that he was, knowing the effect he would have. Uh, again, politicians, we think of them as, as robots. They're not. He would walk into those rooms and their hearts would go out to him and, and, and he, would, he wouldn't care about tributes. What he wanted was Affordable Care Act. Where's my bill? What are you doing about it? And, and even after death, <laughs> it's like... Uh, What's it, Cap Captain Ahab says, from beyond death's door, I, I strike at thee. Um, even after death, Ted Kennedy sends a, a letter to, uh, that he's written obviously when he's alive, but then he dies, and this letter is delivered to the White House, and Barack Obama reads it, and it's this plea. It's, it's not even a plea, it's like, I know, Mr. President, you will fulfill what we have talked about and what was the cause of, of my life. And, uh, and 2009 was a tough political year because you had what was happening on Wall Street with the banks. You had right. the second biggest recession since the Depression. And Obama stuck to it. And again, he had Reid and, and Pelosi. He had orders from the grave. But he had orders from the grave to, to stick with it. And when that bill was signed, um, uh, they had a party at the White House. And Obama says good night. He goes back upstairs to the residency. And as he writes in his memoirs, I thought of two things. I thought of my mother who died young of breast cancer and always had problem with the insurance payments, and I thought of Ted Kennedy. So, um, you know, even though he never saw it, he was, you know, Moses looking over the Jordan River and, yeah. and, and watched it get passed. Knew it was going to pass, yeah. Well, this is a fabulous book, so what's next? Um, I'm not going <laughs> to write any book that has, to, that has Watergate or Vietnam in it, because now I've done, <laughs> I've done Richard Nixon, Tip O'Neill, and Ted Kennedy, and uh, I can't. So you're undecided. I can't think of another way to do it. I'm going to try to do a, a, a group biography uh, uh, on the American Revolution. Oh, Pick that's about, a change of about pace. About 10 people, yeah. Well, I mean, I did change a little bit. century. I did a change of pace with Clarence Darrow, and that's a fascinating time. So if this one doesn't work out, then the, the 19th century still is there as well. Okay, so I think it's time for some questions. Uh, Thad, is there a. I have a question from the Zoom audience. Um, 
What about Kennedy's disgraceful role in the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas hearings? Um, Kennedy survived in Massachusetts in part because of all this immense goodwill that the state had for the Kennedy family, but also because um, the political leaders and the press in Massachusetts was willing to make a distinction between personal behavior, what he does on weekends, and political behavior, and, and they didn't seem to be uh, lapping over. He, he seemed to be effective in the Senate, um, and he had led the opposition to Robert Bork successfully in the Reagan years and stopped Robert Bork, arch conservative, from being on the Supreme Court. Um, so everybody said, well, okay, so, you know, we all know about bad Ted, um, uh, but um, he, he still puts in a good day's, day's work, so we're going to give him a pass on his personal behavior in ways that could never happen now in the Me Too era, by the way. Um, some of the stuff that he did was, would have cost him his seat um, uh, immediately, very boorish um, stuff. Far, you know, this is not even talking about Chappaquiddick. Um, but he's down in Palm Beach for the, for the traditional Easter weekend, and uh, he invites his son and his nephew to go out drinking with him. And when they come back to the house, the nephew has brought a young woman who claims that she was um, uh, raped by the nephew, William Kennedy Smith. And so for nine months, the, the whole thing is, is back in the front pages again. And uh, who gets nominated that summer but Clarence Thomas. And Anita Hill comes forward and says, this is a sexual harasser. And Joe Biden, chairman of the Judiciary Committee, convenes hearings. And Ted Kennedy might as well have had a brown paper bag over his head because he was, he, he was he morally compromised by right. Palm Beach and just could not. Now, and I've had, there's two great accounts of that summer of the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas um, uh, summer. And I've talked to the authors of both of them and they both said to me that in their minds, the, the Ted Kennedy that stopped Bork would have been able to stop Clarence Thomas, except to what happened from Palm Beach. Wow. Thank you for having this uh, event, and particularly, although uh, greetings to the Zoom audience, it's wonderful to be in a room with people sharing ideas. <laughs> um, my question is, um, Ted Kennedy in the fall of 79, Here's a guy who, his family has been in politics for generations. His brother was this acclaimed and martyred president of the United States. He's had more chance to think about the presidency than any other politician ever. And if you dare to challenge the president of your own party, you better damn well know exactly why you're doing it. And he gets on TV with Roger Mudd, and he makes a complete hash of trying to explain why he's running. What's your explanation for why that happened? I believe that the closest Ted Kennedy got to the presidency, the worse he performed. The furthest he got away from the presidency, the better he was. He, the family dynamics was such, and his young brothers, both killed in their 40s, frozen in time as these young heroes, Camelot, I mean, everything, was um, so intimidating to him that he never felt worthy of being in their shoes. And I think there was a self-destruct mechanism, a self-sabotage, that when he got close, um, things went wrong. Summer of 69, he was close. And things went wrong. Um, uh, can't use Palm Beach, but, uh, but most definitely the mud interview. Now, Ted had explanations for it later, which was that, well, I hadn't actually announced yet, so I had to watch what I was saying. But um, they looked at, his people looked at that first interview and said, this is awful. And they insisted that they have a second shot. And it was in the famous second shot interview that, that the famous inability to answer the question, why do you want to be president, happened. So it was, it was more than just that he was, he was ambushed, you know, didn't know what Roger Mudd was going to ask him, thought it was going to be a gauzy Camelot type interview. Um, and he, he just, um, uh, my personal belief is that um, he, he did not think himself worthy of Jack and Bob. Um, and, and so put obstacles in his own, in his own way. <laughs>
One of the things that happened in 1980 is the day of the Wisconsin primary, Jimmy Carter gets on TV and says he's made significant progress. That's not the exact phrase. I have it written down, but I won't look it up. In the um, hostage situation, he goes on, wins the primary. Strangely, they didn't get out for a long time after that. And this is before the October surprise, if it did happen. It would seem to me that's a great ad. The guy who never lied to you got on TV and said there, the thing was solved. It's not. He's either a liar or he's even more incompetent than his <laughs> critics think he is. And that didn't happen. And I make no bones about it. I think Jimmy Carter is a self-righteous, hypocritical piece of garbage. And I celebrate his coming death. But I would like to think that <laughs> now, someone... Now, how do you really feel? <laughs> I've, I've cleaned it up because of <laughs> okay. Zoom. Uh, I think there should be an explanation. Why didn't people go for the throat? Because he's such a despicable human being. Thank you. Um, if you remember that previous summer when he went up to the Camp David and had the, um, the summit meeting with all of America's moral and philo philosophical, political, and business leaders, uh, then came down and gave the uh, famous um, Malays speech, um, part, of, part of all that, ha there, was, there were two thirds, of the, I think, of the gas stations in the country were out of gas that that weekend. Um, it was really hard to believe in July of 79 that uh, Jimmy Carter was going to uh, win re-election. And it really was not until the um, Iranian hostage crisis and the rally around the flag and the, um, uh, uh, Carter's ability to run a Rose Garden campaign um, uh, 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 in, you know, ordinarily the idea that the United States would beat the Russians in ice hockey, you know, a Massachusetts game, not a Georgia game, it, and it would have been something that Ted Kennedy might have been able to use to his campaign, but instead Jimmy Carter had the whole team go down to um, the White House and stand around him, even though he had cut off America's participation in the Summer Olympics because he wanted to teach the Russians a lesson about Afghanistan. So, I mean, Carter just played that extraordinarily well into the spring in Iowa and New Hampshire. One question is why didn't Kennedy drop out then, but um, he felt that he wanted to nudge Carter over to, to the left. Um, but by, by the time Wisconsin happened, there was still, um, you know, Carter was not out of the White House, he was not out of the Rose Garden yet, and there was still this sort of feeling of, you know, band together, um, uh, uh, it's us against you know the world. America wants to get its dignity back, and, and Carter was very, very deft at that all through that that spring. I think that's the answer. Yeah, I, I'd have to take issue with the word despicable. I don't think that applies to Jimmy Carter, but he was politically am, ambitious in a almost ruthless sense. Yeah. And you know, Hunter Thompson, the famous Gonzo journalist of Rolling Stone once described him as the meanest man he'd ever met. <laughs> and that was after he witnessed his first, Carter's first encounter with your Ted Kennedy at yeah, the famous yeah. Law Day speech, where Carter just, you know, uh, decided he was going to outperform this privileged aristocratic politician, okay. and so, he did. So you all ready to win some bar bets? All right. <laughs> okay. Carter never used the word malaise in the malaise speech. He used it in the Law Day speech. Exactly. Which is quite interesting because <laughs> right. that was four years earlier. Yeah. No, he could be very Machiavellian, yeah. and your description of how he handled Kennedy, the Kennedy challenge in the spring of 1980 is, you know, he was, he was ruthless yeah. in pushing all the right buttons. And, and, but all that being said, Ted, all right, all right, stay in. <clears throat> after Iowa and New Hampshire had been carry the liberal banner through the, give somebody a chance to rally around liberalism and, and nudge Carter over to the left. But then you've lost Illinois and okay, all of a sudden New York comes through for you and you're back as a viable candidate, but you know, within a month, Carter has won uh, Ohio and you know you're not gonna be the next president of the United States. He still doesn't drop out. He still doesn't drop out. He still, I mean, and, and, uh, and Carter, and his people still are filled with that same enmity that they've had for, for uh, uh, a dozen, uh, six or seven years. And um, you know, together, I believe those two guys, by not being 
the adults in the playground and the adults in the sandbox. Yeah, they really weakened the Democratic really Party yeah. going into that November election with yeah. Reagan. So. And then Carter um, did not do well in the, um, in the debate, and there you had it. He was never very good on television. Yeah. But. Any other questions? Yes, uh, I'd like to bring one of your other subjects into it. Could you talk about Kennedy's relationship with uh, Tip O'Neill politically, legislatively, politi uh, and personally? And also, could you speak a bit about covering him uh, when you, uh, for the Globe? And then I'm sure you've got stories we could stay here all night, and I'd be happy to, to listen <laughs> to you. Um, <clears throat> well, the Kennedys, uh, within the Democratic universe in Massachusetts, the Kennedys and the O'Neills came from different um, quadrants. Um, the, the Kennedys were really unique unto themselves. Ted Kennedy was actually not even born in Massachusetts. He was born in, uh, in New York, and, uh, but he grew up on, uh, on the Cape, and uh, um, they were idols for Irish America. Um, but Tip O'Neill, was his father was the local uh, sewer commissioner, and Tip grew up in a blue-collar neighborhood um, in uh, North Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, which sounds far tonier than it, than it actually is, and much uh, less so than it, than it was. Um, Tip went to Boston College, Teddy went to Harvard, there was a, you know, uh, there was a, a rivalry there. Uh, on the other hand, there was something that between Tip and John Kennedy that, that clicked. Um, he saw Tip as maybe the best of the old style politicians. And when he was um, running for, um, uh, decided to leave the House and run for the Senate, he tipped off tip um, and said, the seat's gonna be open, why don't you prepare um, uh, to run for it? Because you know, you're not like those other guys the, who, who are tainted by scandal, um, the old machine politicians um, like uh, James Michael um, uh, Curley. Um, you know, you're something better and that, was, that got tip into um, the, the Senate career. Um, he asked for a story. Here's a, here's a, this is uh, one of my favorite um, Tip O'Neill stories is that in, after that campaign, um, Tip had to run for re-election, of course, in two years. And who should show up in his office but James Michael Curley, the rascal mayor of Boston, uh, uh, um, uh, former inmate of the federal penitentiary um, and uh, former governor of the state. And he says, Tip, I just want you to know I've been raising some money for you. And he hands him an envelope. And he says, here's $500. And Tip says, well, thanks a lot, Governor. And he leaves. And Tip looks in the envelope, and there's only $450. <laughs> and two weeks later, Curly comes back in, hands him an envelope, another $450. And, and um, so Tip figures that there's a 10% uh, uh, finder's fee here <laughs> that he's going to have to uh, deal with. And uh, the third time it happens, Tip finally says, but you know, Mr. Governor, I, I got to be able to thank these people that are contributing to you. You know, who are your donors? Who, who's this money coming from? And, and Curly sort of like uh, uh, Rumpelstiltskin says, ah, you've asked the wrong question and poof, disappears and it doesn't, uh, doesn't show up again for the rest of the campaign. So Tip gets reelected and he goes down to Washington. There's a knock on the door one day and a businessman is, is out in the, in, the, uh, in the lobby waiting to see him. And Tip says, I don't know who this guy is. All right, show him in. He's from Massachusetts. And the guy comes in and he says, well, you know, um, uh, Congressman, I'd like you to support such and such. It's very important to my business and to my industry. And, and, and I says, well, why, why would I want to do that? And he said, well, you know, I'm a big donor to your campaign. He says, I've never met you. And he said, well, I, I gave the money to uh, James Michael Curley. Um, <laughs> and he was the one who asked me for the money. And he said that this would, you know, grease the way for this, for this, this project. And so Tip said, ha, 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 I got a great story to tell you about, about Curly. He used to give me these envelopes with $500 and open it up, only $450, you know, he's taking a 10% commission. And the guy started, the businessman started laughing. He said, uh, um, okay, Congressman, I just got one thing to tell you. Uh, I know how much I gave James Michael Curley, and you were the one who was working for 10%. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, I think we'll end this evening. Thank you very much for coming to CUNY. Great book. <laughs>